Well, hello and welcome to episode 111, 111 episode of Drink the Movies. I'm Brian here as always with Michaela. Michaela, 111. It's our 111st birthday. <laughs> so exciting. 111st. Yeah, that's right. Uh, got the got the big uh, triple ones going there. Uh, that's always a good time. Uh, what a way to ring in the new year. Uh, we rang in a new iteration of the Golden Globes earlier this week. Uh, spoiler, we're recording this on Monday, so we have no idea how they shook out. Could have been a hot mess. Could have been a triumphant return. Uh, I don't know for sure, but uh, go check out our Patreon because we're going to be talking about the uh, all the winners and losers and kind of our general thoughts of the show over there. But what else have you been up to, Michaela? You've been, uh, you've been making any headway on your Oscar list? or you just been hanging out having some good cocktails what you been up to i've been doing all of the above i feel like um okay. uh started looking at some of the short lists for best foreign films so i got all quiet on the western front uh watched mm-hmm. uh, i think that's on netflix and that was whew, amazing and dark and awful and really beautifully so beautifully done um that was really good um what have you seen? What have you been yeah. drinking? Uh, yeah, so I, uh, I too, have been kind of going through the Oscar uh, shortlist a little bit there. Um, I, you and I actually watched All Quiet on the Western Front together. And yeah, that one was uh, you know, really in- incredibly grim and beautiful kind of at the same at the same time it's a really kind of compelling story and a really kind of intimate look on you know what war does and who the people who are really involved in fighting these wars are are all about really so um it's definitely a good watch definitely not not for kids and you know definitely could be really upsetting um you know to some people but very good very good there on the uh, short list coming out of the uh international features so i have to keep an eye on that i've actually seen it on uh some of the short lists for um, in the best picture category as well. So we'll definitely have to have to keep yeah. an eye on that. But, you know, I've uh, just been doing that. I've been making my way through my leftover uh, Christmas beers. Uh, you know, that's always always a good time. And, uh, you know, just, kind of, just been kind of hanging out. You know, it's been rainy and cold uh, here in the Charlotte area. So it's been a perfect time to stay indoors and have a drink and uh, catch up on some movies. Um, and, you know, even if you're not catching up on movies, sometimes it's good to go and revisit a classic. Um, you know, even if it's something that you that you know, the twist it's it's still worth going back back to see and that's what we're going to be talking about today in the sixth sense so why don't we do this michaela why don't we take a quick break and we will have to whip up a cocktail that is worthy of all six of the senses so let's take a quick break and we'll be right back so this week's cocktail comes from allrecipes.com and it takes a name and inspiration from this week's movie the sixth sense and i gotta say when i looked at it I felt a little bad, Brian, because we have talked a lot about Mm -hmm. uh, my reverence for you and your and your palate and the things that you love and the things that you hate. (laughs) Two things Brian does not like. If if this is the first time uh, you're listening to (laughs) Drink the Movies, welcome to the 111st episode. Brian doesn't like two things. Number one is shots. Number two is coconut. And of course, this sucker has an ounce and a half of cream of coconut in it. And I'm real sorry. Yeah, it is, uh, it, it is literally the first ingredient. Uh, that, that's okay. That's okay. But yeah, your your words say uh, that you that you care about my palate, and then your actions uh, prove otherwise. But um, I don't know. So we got this recipe. It's called the Sixth Sense, and uh, you're looking at it, and it is kind of uh, it it is kind of a mystery, right? It's uh, it, it's exactly like M Night uh, Shyamalan. It's it's this director. Um, it done kind of this uh, direct to direct to movie direct to video dvd i don't know what it was uh kind of thing so you don't know much about m night Shyamalan. you don't know much about this story it's kind of mysterious sixth sense what is that uh and what are these ingredients and how do they go together that was my question for you i'm i'm looking at these things and i said that's not gonna go together at all but what you do is you stick all these things in a blender and they do go together (laughs) who knew who knew i have to say uh, I was a little concerned about the gin aspect versus we when we said this when we were looking at the ingredients it's like oh, this might be better with vodka but I have to say when we actually did it the juniper brought it out um so you uh do you want me to go through all the ingredients yeah go through go through these these ingredients and okay. uh, yeah just 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 keep in mind that yeah these are going to come together uh just fine just it, trust it, us trust yeah. all recipe don't always trust all recipes that's not true but uh trust us and trust them uh this time yeah trust the process okay you're gonna take half a cup of ice okay you're gonna take an ounce and a half of cream of coconut you're gonna take an ounce of gin 
You're going to take an ounce of Amaro liqueur, okay? You're going to take half an ounce of pineapple juice and half an ounce of lime juice. You're going to mix all of that together. You're going to blend it in a blender, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> then mm -hmm. you're going to add three dashes of aromatic bitters, such as Angostura's, if that's what you got. Yep. Then you're going to drink it. It's going to look like this milky white sludge. <laughs> but it's going to taste pretty good. It's yeah, it's going to it's going to look like that. It looks like if you could uh, see dead people, uh, this might be what they look like. I don't know for sure, uh, but that's what's coming out of the blender. And uh, yeah, to to be honest, like I said, Michaela, I saw I saw the coconut. I saw the pineapple juice. I saw the gin. I said, that doesn't make any sense those things don't go together i don't i don't like the sound of that at all but we're we're gonna try it you know we're we're consummate professionals if nothing uh and we'll we'll try most things so uh threw this together and um i have to say this was oddly delicious i don't know <laughs> i don't know what it was but some reason uh it, it was so good and we made a couple versions of it because you know we had mentioned that we thought that the gin really seemed out of place uh the amaro you know could be out of place it, it your mileage may vary depending on exactly which uh version of amaro uh you want to use but the gin felt really odd uh to us so we wanted to try it with vodka we tried one uh with rum to make more of a tiki tropical kind of a drink and guess what michaela i like the gin the best gin <laughs> was the best hands gin down was the best yeah oh yeah for sure. And I think we used uh, just a Seagram's gin because we're not fancy and we we didn't want to ruin it. <laughs> we didn't want to ruin our gin. <laughs> That's how little faith we had, I think, in this cocktail. But um, it actually, I think we could have done something that was more juniper forward and it would have rounded it out even more. Um, it's, it's such a weird con cacophony of ingredients. Um, we don't use a lot of Amaro. We had a couple... <clears throat> and so we had to we had to pick the one the one that we thought would go best but um i really liked this and i thought that it would be really fun to do this um if you're going to do like uh like a halloween party and you're going to or mm -hmm. a viewing party where you do the sixth sense a lot of people think that the sixth sense is pretty spooky and scary we thought about doing this the halloween month but um we decided because it was also a really well done film we wanted to bring it into oscar season so um, I think that this could be really fun as a group drink, like that you would make in mass and mm -hmm. be able to kind of, uh, meter out to more than, you know, more than a few people. Um, and it would probably keep pretty well. The cream of coconut, it just looks so weird in it because it's that milky, fleshy, white, yeah. goopy. <laughs> yeah. It's so almost like the, yeah, it's almost like this, uh like uh like iridescent uh kind of kind of thing as it goes into the glass there as it mixes with yeah. that pineapple juice and you get kind of yeah this this shimmery white kind of a kind of a color which is which is kind of spooky and it's it's very chilling and and cold you know every time uh you know ghosts pop into the room you know it feels like the temperature drops by uh yeah. 20 degrees and and that's what this was feeling like but i don't know there was something there was something oddly refreshing and delicious about this and i don't know it's something that i might have to have to revisit because you know you made me go out and buy all this cream of coconut and now i'm gonna have to use it for something so there might you as go well be this might yeah, as well be this i can't i cannot do any more cream of coconut drinks for at least another six months so that, that's right we'll get to my Not next lot. favorite movie and we'll be doing some more uh, coconut no doubt but uh yeah this was really good so give it a shot um try it try it with the gin try it with a uh, different spirit and let us know kind of you know how you like to how you like to do these up but now michaela we have these made uh let's go blend up another one or two because you know it's about to get real spooky in here so let's take a quick break we'll mix up some more of these and we'll be right back to talk about this week's film the sixth sense Spoiler warning for The Sixth Sense. If you've not seen this 1999 spooky film from M. Night Shyamalan, um, you should know that he's famous for really big twists. And there's a big one at the end of this film, and we're going to talk all about it. So if you've not seen it, we are going to spoil this for you, and you will hate us. So do yourself a favor. Go watch the film. Go make yourself up a Six Sense cocktail because it's oddly delicious. And then come back and we can chat about this uh, 1999 thriller with a twist. Uh, 
<laughs> this thriller with a twist. That's right. Yeah. Um, as you mentioned, Michaela it came out in 1999. And um, as you mentioned, it was directed by M. Night Shyamalan, uh, who's pretty new on the directing scene. And it stars Bruce Willis as our award winning child psychologist, Malcolm Crow, and Haley Joel Osment as Cole Sear, uh, Malcolm's uh, newest patient. Um, and yeah, like, like you said, Michaela, this did kind of take the world by storm. And part of the big reason for that was this twist. It became sort of a a a pin in M. Night Shyamalan's uh, storytelling. And we really get that sort of started here. Um, and this movie did pretty well. It made a lot of money and got some critical acclaim. It was nominated for six Academy Awards, uh, film editing, original screenplay, director for uh, Shyamalan, original screenplay from Shyamalan as well, uh, supporting actress for Tony Collette. And... Haley Joel Osment as a uh, supporting actor. And then the big one, it was also nominated for Best Picture. So uh, this this got a lot of, like I said, Michaela, a lot of accolades, made a lot of money. This was this was the buzz of the town. It was. Um, I do remember thinking at the time that Haley Joel Osment and Tony Collette were shoe-ins for um, the Academy Award nominations. And they were nominated. They did not win. Uh, but, oh my gosh. Uh, so good. And I forgot that um, because Tony Collette has done a couple, had done a couple of other things before this, but this really brought her to the forefront of American cinema, um, which was really, really cool. And I'd forgotten that aspect. And um, yeah, so let's get into it. There's, there's a lot. Uh, I don't know if we're going to be able to talk about all the ins and outs of this film, because there's a lot of different scenes that have really amazing um, kind of bits in it. So, but let's, let's get started. Yeah, there's there's definitely a lot of little nuggets uh, through this. And um, and, you know, as as we get in towards the end and we talk about the twist, that's one of the the kind of things that really stands out is that you miss a lot of these nuggets on your first viewing, which is why uh, kind of that twist at the end is so uh, effective and kind of this way that M. Night Shyamalan was able to weave the story. But yeah, let's get into this a little bit. So uh, right off the bat, uh, we see a woman going down into her basement wine cellar to grab a bottle of wine lady right after our own hearts Michaela uh but we find out that is uh Anna Crow the wife of Malcolm Crow she takes the wine back upstairs Malcolm is sitting there uh they both seem to be a little bit buzzed having a really nice time because Malcolm has just won an award being the best children's psychologist of all time in the history of man or something I don't know he is uh, really good at his job won an award they're getting drunk but it's not all good news uh <laughs> it's not right all now. good news because uh, apparently one of your patients uh, is in your house, uh, in your bathroom, uh, standing in his underwear. Vincent Gray has made his return and uh, not not great. Not great no. for the crows. Not great. I mean, it's really a shame because uh, Vincent Gray is played by uh, Donnie Wahlberg, I believe. New and he's on the block. Yeah, he's yeah. amazing in this because he looks really unattractive as you should uh and you'll, you'll if you've not seen it you'll know it when you see it um he he just looks so tortured and so sad and just like he doesn't want to be there but Had he's strung out yeah. yeah yeah and at first uh you know uh Malcolm Crow is like look you've entered a <laughs> he's real calm because he knows how to deal with people who are perhaps in psychological distress and so at first he tries to calm him down he says you might uh you might not realize what you've done here. You're in this house. There's no drugs here. There's no, there's no money here. Uh, if, if you don't mind, take whatever you want and leave. And he realizes that it is one of his former patients. Now he, Malcolm only works with children. And so this is a person that has grown up and um, accuses Malcolm of not helping him, not believing him, not, uh, not being there for him. And so Malcolm tries to calm him down. It's, it's a really tough scene because Vincent Gray is just, too too far gone at this point and he ends up shooting malcolm in kind of the stomach and then turning the gun on himself and uh it's not super gory but it's gory enough you definitely um feel this scene and it's tough because it's the first five minutes of, yeah. of what is just kind of an emotional roller coaster uh from a from a, a kind of spookiness like it, it it definitely sets you up and buckles you in for a for a real bumpy ride yeah, for sure. Um, and yeah, you mentioned kind of the way that he looks. Donnie Wahlberg said in an interview that I was uh, reading that he lost 41 pounds 
for this part because he he really wanted it. He really wanted to do this and to get into some more serious acting um, and things like that. So yeah, it, you you can't even recognize that it's Donnie Wahlberg unless you unless you look it up and you're like, oh okay, imagine that. Look at that. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of how we get the movie started with uh, Malcolm there with a bullet to the stomach, and then we are going to uh, kind of turn the page a little bit and we are going to go um, and have our first kind of encounter uh, with little Cole Sear, uh, played by Haley Joel Osment, coming out of the house. We see Malcolm sitting there kind of across the street watching as he's you know kind of coming in and out of the house a little bit and making his way to school but uh we find out pretty quickly that cole is a kid who seems to be afflicted with a lot of the same things that uh vincent gray was right he's he's very quiet he's very detached he doesn't have a lot of friends uh not very good like in these social situations and uh kind of the mom and the school thinks that, that it's because of like this divorce uh, that's happened between his yep. parents. Maybe, yep. maybe that's what's uh, triggering it. But, but Malcolm, Malcolm knows that, you know, he's going to have to talk to this kid and uh, figure this, figure this out. This is kind of Malcolm's chance at redemption, I guess, uh, after, uh, after seeing his failings uh, li- literally uh, come in the form of a bullet from uh, Vincent Gray to, uh, to make a man, right. I, I guess, within himself. Yeah. And it's interesting because, you know, Malcolm has these really great ways of conversing with the child. Cole um, tries to get him to talk to him. There's a scene where they're in a church and Cole has got these like little army men and Malcolm's asking him about them. And, you know, Cole spouts off some Latin and it, it kind of triggers Cole, Cole, um, or it triggers Malcolm to go and do some of this research. Um, He keeps going, uh, trying to go into his office and his office is perpetually locked. So um, he ends up finding out some of these Latin terms. He goes in and kind of is reinvestigating the recordings that he himself had with Vincent Gray when Vincent Gray was a child. And he's like, oh, man, they they really are uh, similarly afflicted, but they don't he doesn't really know what it is yet. And Cole's mom is played by the amazing Tony Collette. She is um, kind of hard as nails. You can tell she's working two jobs. She's really trying to keep it together, um, trying to keep you know their little apartment clean, trying to keep her son happy. And she knows something is desperately wrong. But Cole isn't really talking to her about what's going on. And he talks, he lets Malcolm know that he doesn't want to tell her the truth because it, as soon as he says to her what's happening, she's going to see him differently. Mm-hmm. And... Um, that really resonated with me, uh, the, this time watching it, because, you know, as you, if you are a, a feeling like you're differently abled in some way, and there's something like wrong with you, you don't want the closest people to think of you as anything other than, um, who you are. And she just worships her son. She thinks he's brilliant. Um, they have a really good kind of banter of talking to each other through their day and, or, th- you know, about how their day is going and, Um, she's not oblivious to the fact that he's not happy, but he won't tell her what's actually going on. And so there's Mm -hmm. this really interesting dynamic that Malcolm almost takes on this parental role in some ways um, within this therapy that seems to be kind of happening over the course of the weeks and months. Yeah, for sure. And um, you'd mentioned, you know, that he didn't want to, to tell his mom and that's kind of, you know, the big reason why, you know, she thinks his teachers think that it's really spurred by the divorce, you know, not that there's something more serious going on because he's not um, really talking about it or addressing it in any way. And that's, you know, kind of one of the big recurring themes for Cole, you know, he is telling Malcolm, you know, uh, I can't tell people the truth because then they look at me different. That's kind of one of the big sticking points for him is that I don't want people to look at me uh, different. I don't want, (laughs) you know, don't look at me. Don't, don't see me in this way that I actually am. And um, that's kind of a, a, you know, a theme that keeps getting uh, replayed over and over again uh, with Cole, you know, between him and his mom, between him and Malcolm, between uh, him and his teachers and him and his uh, kind of classmates and stuff like that. Um, and we're finding out, you know, that it's not it's not all, uh, you know, it's it's not all good news. Right. He's obviously, um, you know, has has some troubles there kind of fitting in at school. And one of the things we learn kind of right off is he's drawn uh, some of these pictures that are a little darker uh, themed uh, things, which which obviously, you know, sets off some uh, some you know, red flags there. And uh, he's talking to Malcolm. And I I really like that, um, 
you know, he, he kind of says he's, I don't draw like that anymore. Um, because now, and you know, Malcolm asked him what he does draw. And he says, now I draw rainbows because they don't have meetings over rainbows. So um, That's right. I thought, I thought that that stuff was really great. And then we get into school, um, and his teacher's there and, you know, uh, Cole's, you know, kind of telling him uh, what he sees and what the history of the building is there. And that's kind of when you get the first kind of snap of the way that he's reacting to to people, you know, kind of getting a peek behind the curtain of, you know, that he's a little bit more troubled than uh, right. you know, just upset about a divorce. Yeah, I mean, he's in a school in Philadelphia that's like 200 years old. And of course, they don't want to talk about any of the bad stuff that happens in the school. But no, we, he... don't, we don't do that. Yeah, but he uh, he knows, uh, Cole knows. And when he calls out the teacher and says, hey, there were people that were killed in this building because it was a courthouse. And of course, the teacher kind of plays it down and says no and doesn't really want to have that real conversation. Um, Cole doesn't take it well. And Cole knows things about people because he is, um, because of, of, of what's happening to him, he knows things that no one else knows. So it really puts uh, both teachers and the administration off it puts other kids off and of course uh if you're weird you're gonna get picked on if you're real strange like cole is presenting um they're gonna go out of their way to bully you and so one of the one of the hardest scenes for me to really watch was um cole's mom has arranged for some of the school kids uh to kind of invite him to a birthday party even though he isn't really wanted there in the first place um and all the other parents are kind of downstairs and the mom's downstairs, but Cole and his quote unquote friends are upstairs and Cole uh, sees this is a really old house. And there's like one of these little doors um, that, you know, it's kind of a crawl space, but it's on, it's up in the attic and it looks terrifying anyway. I, I would put, I would have definitely put a bureau drawer set up there or something in front of that because it looks scary as heck um he sees it and he really freaks out because he you can tell that he's either hearing something or seeing something that's in that door that scares him to death and what do the kids do of course they're horrible horrible bullies and they push him in there and lock the door and so the mom i mean it's like 10 minutes maybe and the mom starts to look around and she finally can hear him banging on the door he's totally terrified absolutely awful I want to beat the crap out of all the kids because they're just horrible people. Um, I want to beat the parents. Like I'm so <laughs> mad watching this scene. Um, but the mom of course is just uh, completely out of her element. She doesn't know what to do. And so of course then Malcolm is seen then talking to Cole and saying, Hey, look, this is, re we've gone beyond like you getting um, bullied or you, you know, people are actually, this is really going to affect you. And people are actually putting you in harm's way. Now we have to talk about this. And that's mm -hmm. when Cole finally confesses in this really close knit, tightly shot scene. Uh, and again, Haley Joel Osment is so amazing because as a child actor, you don't expect this range of emotion. And he goes mm -hmm. from being hopeful to being angry, to being scared. And he's got this one tear in his eye and it's so beautifully shot between a really tight frame of his face and Malcolm's face. And when he says the words, you know, I see dead people, you don't, you, you, you're so just touched. I, I'm, you're just so moved that that's what's happening. And you kind of know it. <laughs> yeah it's built up but when he says it it's very climactic yeah and it, you know and for better or worse that kind of turned into sort of like this uh meme aspect of this of the icy dead people and you saw that kind of parodied uh to death as you had all those parody uh movies coming out but yeah it's it's really impactful and he goes on to tell them you know i see dead people you know and yeah, the dead don't know that they're dead and they only see the things that they want to see and you know that's and that's really what's what's haunting him and you know malcolm malcolm takes that and kind of information i guess and is like eh, i don't know i don't know if i believe this this kid can really see dead people that doesn't make a lot of sense uh maybe i need to stop coming around maybe the i can't really help this kid um so he goes back and he's kind of listening back to his uh kind of 
tape stuff with Vincent and going back through that. And um, that's really when he's kind of seeing a lot of the similarities. And then Malcolm also is, you know, kind of going through this and it seems like he's being, you know, he's very detached from his wife now. Uh, like he shows up late to a dinner um, in which she kind of really won't acknowledge him. And, you know, until she, you know, finally says, you know, happy anniversary. And, you know, there's uh, a couple other scenes where, you know, he's down in the basement and we see some guy kind of show up and you see, you just feel like there's some sort of strange on or strange. You feel like there's some sort of strain on their relationship. Yeah. You're not quite a hundred percent sure. You assume that it's probably some sort of uh, trauma, you know, resulting from the, you know, the, what had happened with Vincent and uh, breaking into the house and, and shooting them. So you don't get a lot of kind of clarity on what's going on there, but we start to get a little bit more clarity with uh, Cole, with what, with what he's got going on. So as they keep kind of meeting, uh, they work out eventually that, um, you know, maybe the best way, if you're seeing dead people, if you're seeing ghosts, maybe you need to give them a hand, say, Hey ghost, what, what can I help you with? And that'll get, get this ghost up out of here. I don't want ghosts in here. Uh, just, just help them and be right. on their way. Yeah. I mean, they're real scary looking, right? So, and we meet a few of them. So one of the w ones that always terrified me was a kid who looks like he's in the seventies, he's got bell bottoms on and he looks perfectly fine. Um, I, the front of him does. And he's like, Hey, Hey. And he looks like he's talking to Cole as if he sees Cole. And then he's like, come over and uh, come here. Let me show you my dad's gun. And then he turns around and like half of his head is blown off. And um, that's real scary. The, the score is amazing because this is really not a boo gotcha kind of horror film, but I jump every time I see it because of the score. It's so good. Um, but there's a lot of things he's in, he's, he ends up being in these environments where people are, are talking to him. And sometimes because of the way in which they died or the circumstances of their own life, they're not handling it well. They're angry, they're upset, and he doesn't know what to do. And so when he and Malcolm talk a little bit about, hey, well, maybe they want something, maybe we can ask them what they want. Um, and maybe they'll, if we do that, they might leave you alone. I mean, maybe it doesn't have anything to do with you, Cole, at all. They're not mad at you and they're not going to hurt you. Um, and so, you know, one of the scariest scenes is uh, Cole wakes up one night. Um, he uh, has this tent that he's built. Um, one thing I love about him, though, is he like he goes to this church because he thinks it's going to save him. Um, and he steals all these like religious um figurines like so he's got a bunch of virgin marys he's got a bunch of jesus's and they're all in this like like um child made kind of homage to religion <laughs> because he's like mm -hmm. maybe jesus will save me i mean at nine i think that's pretty smart i i don't know i thought that was i thought that was cool and he makes this these this tent out of um paper clips or uh clothes clips and like an old red curtain and it's so sumptuous mm -hmm. um it's the the set direction on here and the scenery is just beautiful. And so he sleeps in there, um, but he is woken up one night and it's really terrifying. He sees this girl and it, it, oh, it's just so scary. <laughs> she's like, yep. she's getting sick all over the place. And, and then, and then she's like, I'm fine. I feel much better, but it's so oh, scary. <laughs> Cause yeah. He, <laughs> yeah yeah it is scary he kind of wakes up to this girl and um you know it's kind of taking malcolm's advice she gives him you know kind of kind of this box to uh to take and present it uh, her funeral which he goes to then uh with malcolm and um one of my i have two shots in this movie that i really like but i really like kind of this funeral section because it's just one steady kind of choreographed shot is the camera moves through this uh funeral and it's you know, kind of touching in on all these people but um uh, we find out in the box there was a, a videotape that shows uh, her mother was poisoning her, which is why she's you know you know, keeps throwing up is in the in the afterlife here is she's a ghost and you know that kind of kind of solves the problem uh, for for that ghost right I guess she's able to to move on and uh, Cole's like oh, okay so maybe the ghosts aren't here to to be bad and awful to me maybe they just they just really need my help and Cole is able to kind of kind of take that knowledge and you know go forth and improve uh, his. Uh, status a little bit in school he starts to you know get out there he's not quite so shy and isolated he's able to to kind of get out and do things he's in like the you know school play and stuff like stuff like that but you know we keep kind of um going through the through the story here and uh you know eventually it, it's going to kind of get to a head because he still hasn't really told anyone 
you know, what is really causing him this trouble, right? Malcolm knows, um, and Cole knows, of course, you know, Cole's, you know, it's happening to Cole, but, uh, his mom still doesn't know, right? It's, there's yeah. still a bunch of stuff going on that she doesn't, she doesn't believe, uh, including a necklace that keeps getting moved, uh, that belonged to, uh, her mother or her grandmother. Um, and you know, uh, you know, she assumes that Cole's the one moving it, but, uh, Cole eventually has to kind of, kind of face facts and tell mom the truth. Ugh. And that scene is like the best to the hardest. Oh, it's so good. Um, I love right before we get to that part. I love the last scene between Malcolm and Cole because they're it's right after the school play. Um, he went to go. Malcolm went to see it and he says, you did really well. I'm so proud of you like a dad would. Right. Um, and he says, you know, what do you what do you you know, I think this is the last time we're going to see each other. And Cole gives Malcolm advice, which is uh, very um, kind of out, out, outside. It's very nice. Very it's nice. very nice. And he says, look, you know, you you want to talk to your wife. You know, you should do it when she's sleeping because then you can tell her all the things and she'll still hear it. Um, and that way, you know, you won't have the space in between you guys that he's feeling when she's when she's right in front of him. And he says, oh, you know, maybe I'll do that. Um, but that's like the last time they, they see each other and they don't hug goodbye or anything, but you, you feel like, um, they're both kind of equipped with the strength that the other has given them to kind of move forward. And that's why the scene I think works so beautifully because it goes right into the scene where there, uh, Cole's in the car with his mom. There's been an accident up front, uh, you know, like a mile ahead and they're in back-to-back -back traffic. And as you do, when you're in back-to-back -back traffic, you're like, what is going on up there? Oh my God. And, um, Cole knows, um, he knows because he can see, um, the person that's died. And so, um, it's a really, beautiful but very tough conversation that he has with Tony Collette and of course uh being a parent myself I, I mean she reacts in just such a beautifully organic way um to him explaining to her what he sees um it's really it's really a beautifully special scene yeah absolutely because they'd had kind of um, this argument before, um, kind of when the truth almost came out, I had mentioned, you know, about the the necklace being moved and, you know, they're kind of having this head. That's my other kind of favorite um, scene in here. And I think it's really powerful and why they both were nominated for the Academy Award, because it's a it's the steady shot of the two of them setting at um, this kitchen table, uh, having dinner. And they're going back and forth about this um, about this necklace with Cole, you know, kind of afraid to tell her. And then um, he does end up telling her then in the, the car when, you know, his mom doesn't believe him you know, about that he can see, you know, the, the lady that died in the, in the car crash up ahead, you know, she thinks that he's uh, talking nonsense. And then he, you know, goes on to talk about, you know, the grandmother and, and things and about how she, he, she remembers, uh, you know, seeing her dance or something like that. And, you know, how then, you know, his mom knows that it's true that, that, uh, that he can indeed see dead people. And that's, you know, really what the, what the trouble has been with him, uh, all along, um, able to kind of, you know, confide in her that way. And um, yeah, he had uh, confided in Malcolm that way too, right? He tells her, tells Malcolm to go and talk to his wife while she's, while she's asleep. That way she has to listen to you, uh, he says. And he goes and uh, Malcolm is uh, talking to her there. She's kind of asleep in uh, kind of this like lounge chair, kind of a, kind of a thing. And uh, he's telling her and, you know, he's apologizing for, you know, being, being so distant and, you know, letting things uh, kind of change and, uh, you know, kind of that way. And then, um, uh, I, f I forget exactly what she says. She says, I, I forgive you or I miss no, you. She, she asked she him, I... she asked him why he left her. Yeah. So, um, and then uh, I kind of get the uh, ultimate realization there as, um, he sees, uh, she kind of, she kind of rolls over and drops his wedding band, uh, out of her hand. And he looks down at his own hand and sees that it's, that it's not on there. And, uh, kind of at that point it is dawning on, uh, Malcolm and it is dawning on the rest of us in the audience that uh, Malcolm has just been seeing what he wants to see. Sometimes ghosts don't even know that they're ghosts. Yeah, and he can't get into his office because there's a drawer in front of the door, um, so it's not locked at all, which I found interesting uh, because he could still get in. He just couldn't see himself unlocking the door because there was no way for him to do that. Um, so he just kind of floats down there, I guess, and doesn't realize that he's done it. Um, and this whole time, this whole time, Cole has known that he's a ghost. And that's why at first he's kind of scared of him and doesn't want to talk to him. Um, 
And so it really is this relationship that is not, wasn't just a parent patient uh, doctor relationship and it wasn't this familial thing. It was um, kind of human to ghost, which adds uh, just a different level of complexity to it. Um, but most audience members are completely shocked at this point. Um, the good thing is that, you know, Malcolm does use this time once he's come to terms with that, which he does fairly quickly, I probably quickly, more quickly than I would have, if I realized that I'd been dead. Um, but he does have, uh, use that time to, to tell his wife everything that's in, in his heart and tell her that he loves her and that, um, and that he, you know, really did have her uh in his heart the whole time that they were together and um he kind of makes peace with that and is able to move on um and, and you don't really know where that is i mean there's a lot of religious connotation uh at the beginning because of cole's you know wanting to go into the church and feel that maybe that's his safe space and then he has all these religious um icons in his little um, tent that he makes. Um, but you don't necessarily, you know, think that he's going to heaven or, or hell or anything like that. He's just moving on to another space. Um, he's, mm -hmm. he's going to leave, he's going to leave and let his wife kind of move on and heal. And, um, and, uh, that's a really beautiful thing. And and that's how it ends really. Yeah, that's right. He kind of, kind of blips out and that's how it ends. And hopefully, uh, kind of with this, uh, new knowledge of, uh, that he's able to see dead people and how he can help them. Hopefully Cole, uh, is, uh, all the better, uh, now for things going forward and, uh, you know, can, can carry on there, but yeah, that's kind of how it ends. It's, uh, it's a story, uh, about Malcolm in a way. It's a story about Cole in a way and how they were able to kind of help each other. Um, and that is, uh, pretty neat. So, uh, Michaela, um, we mentioned it kind of at the top and we've been alluding to it, uh, kind of a couple of times throughout this thing, but this was the, the twist of movie twists. This was, uh, this was kind of the talk of the town. And I think that this is really kind of the last chance and the last hurrah for something like this to have happened. Um, and I think that's why it was so special and so well received because the year was 1999. We had the internet, but certainly it wasn't like the internet is today. You couldn't make the sense, sense today because the first person that saw it would have put it up on Twitter and everyone would have, would have known. And watching this after you know the twist is so completely different than watching it before you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's why we we were real clear. <laughs> On the on the spoiler warning because this is one where it really would have spoiled it completely. Um, it is a different experience watching it the first time from watching it the second time or or however many times. Um, it's still enjoyable, but yeah, I I I find it interesting too that um, what one thing I liked about it is because it was so widely like you could get it on DVD, right? Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't one of those things where you could only watch it if you could afford to go to a theater or have the occasion to go to a theater. I think something like this might be done well if it's one of those things where it's immediately streamable. If you watch it that first week, it, you have a chance of it not getting spoiled. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I think the timing played out really well. And unfortunately, unfortunately, M. Night Shyamalan's really tried to be known for uh, the twisty kind of the, the, the strange twists at the end of his movies. Most people mm -hmm. expect that from him. And because this one was so beautifully done and there, you know, with the timing of when it was released and how it was released, um, you know, I think that pretty much all of his other films kind of get unfairly, um, compared to this, um, because most people think that this is his by far his best film of, uh, to date. Um, mm -hmm. and I don't know if that's actually a fair assessment or not. Um, but it, it definitely is the one that surprised people the most, I would say. Yeah, that's, um, that's, that's kind of the, the blessing and the curse of something like that, right? Is, is you do it the first time and you do it really well. And then, you know, that's, that's fantastic, but it's, you know, then it's kind of this unachievable thing that you can ever, ever do again. Right. Cause then you have to, <laughs> you're the, you're the guy then from now on that makes movies with these incredible twists that no one saw coming. Um, and were so apparent the entire time and you have to have to kind of live up to that. And, uh, you know, he's had, uh, several chances to uh, do this, the, the timing for talking about this actually works out really well because we're talking about it in terms of kind of the, you know, the Oscar ramifications for it because it's Oscar season. But we've also got his next uh, film, Knock at the Cabin, is coming out here in just a couple of weeks, um, which looks interesting. And maybe we'll have to talk about that one um, here at some point as well. But but yeah, like I said, it, it really kind of 
<laughs> it sets you up for failure and it sets you up for success, right? Because you're going to keep your you're nom nominated for the Oscar for directing for for writing the screenplay. So you're going to get lots of opportunities to tell your stories, but it's going to be really hard to live up to to something like this and the the twist that you had. Um, you know, as we kind of get through in every couple of years, yeah, you know, Unbreakable Signs, The Village, Lady in the Water, uh, you know, so so a lot of stuff that that people seem to be you know either really into or really not into. Uh, but The Sixth Sense was something that everyone was into. That's right. Uh, Sixth Sense was definitely, I remember, you know, it, it became an Unbreakable or Sixth Sense question. It's like, which one did you think was better and why? And then it was Signs versus Unbreakable versus Sixth Sense, which is interesting. Signs is very polarizing of a film. Uh, I think people either really loved it or hate it. I'm in the love it camp and I'll always love it. Um, uh, but I think that uh, this film really did a lot for um, from an acting. It really could. It really brought a bunch of really amazing, gripping storytelling together in a way that hadn't been done. Um, and because it did it in the way that it did it, it's been really hard to replicate since. Um, so, you know, he, he's definitely M Night Shyamalan makes great thrillers. Um, I don't know if he's made one he's, uh, that has had the same effect on audiences as as this one has, um, which is not a bad thing because this is a beautiful film and it's aged really well. I'm happy to say it terrified me just as much as it did the first time. <laughs> um, if you if if it wasn't okay for your kids to watch it in 1999, still on still not okay for your kids to watch it. Um, it's not. You know, it doesn't have anything where it's cringy or agey, where you're like, ah, people did that back then. So we're going to kind of make excuses for it, anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, and so I think it really does stand the test of time. Yeah, for sure. And it still, you know, it, it still looks really great. The framing of uh, the scenes and the lighting are all are all really well and the, the story plays out really well too so it's still enjoyable to watch even if you know the twist um and it's funny after you see the twist you can't unsee it because then every time you're like oh yeah it's totally <laughs> it's so obvious it was right here the whole time and we totally missed it um and like you said michaela it, you know it brought a lot in terms of like the acting and the storytelling and you know we mentioned uh, about the the academy awards that it was was nominated for and kind of the big one of those i mean it was nominated for best picture um but it was nominated for Best Supporting Actor for Haley Joel Osment, uh, which was really special uh, because every every few years uh, you get a child actor who gets nominated for you know Best Supporting Actor or Actress, um, and that's always really special. Um, but I I distinctly remember um, at the time that this came out, this one seemed extra special because it seemed really plausible that uh, Haley Joel Osment could win that award. Um, a lot of times it doesn't you know they get there's a nomination for a child actor, but you know it's yeah, kind of, kind of just in a, you know, honorable mention sort of, cat you know, sort of, uh, sort of uh, category, but uh, Haley Joel Osment really seemed plausible that he could win. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, it seems now that when children, young people get nominated, it's like a cute, trendy thing. And I don't mean, I, I don't, I'm not saying that that's how I feel about it. I think that that's how um, it's perceived by, you know, the people at large want don't want to give it to a child. I, I don't know what the I don't know why it's I guess it's hard because the the there's this idea that children cannot feel things or or show things in the depths of emotion and all the different layers that adults can do, maybe because our frontal cortex isn't, cre you know, uh, set in stone yet and we're not able to to really do that but the variation of emotion that Haley Joel Osment did was absolutely amazing and seeing it now because it's been a while since I'd seen this I'm more blown away than I was for sure I mean yeah, he, he was truly amazing and I'm trying to see who won instead <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so Michael Caine won that year for Cider House Rules, which is uh, very just. We we're uh, we're big Michael Caine fans we are. around here, so uh, so that's just. You also had uh, Michael Clark Duncan for The Green Mile uh, was nominated in that category uh, that year as well. Really excellent um, uh, role for him. So, uh, but yeah, I, I remember thinking that a lot of people really thought that Haley Joel Osment was going to going to win that award, and um, you know he didn't. But yeah, looking back on it, you know twenty three years later uh now uh def definitely could have because uh he was really great and uh you know we've talked about it a time or two here on on the podcast about other movies and other actors and situations but you know if if the character of 
Cole Sear doesn't work if he's not believable, if he's not as sort of grown up in his emotions, uh, it, the, the story falls apart. It doesn't, it doesn't work. So yeah, um, yeah just uh, excellent stuff there. So uh, that's kind of uh, our rundown on the sixth sense. It's a really good movie. Uh, hopefully you'd seen it before, um, or I guess if, if not, you had no intention and, and by now you probably had had it spoiled uh, anyway because the internet became a thing. So uh, let us know at home if you watched The Sixth Sense back in the day. If you've watched it recently, let us know that. And let us know if you make a Sixth Sense cocktail because we want to know all about it and what you thought about that weird uh, concoction of uh, crazy ingredients going together in your blender. We want to know all that stuff. And you can send us pictures and comments and feedback and all that stuff on our Instagram and Twitter and Hive. It's at Drink the Movies and on Facebook.com slash Drink the Movies. If you want to see pictures of ours, episode recaps, all that good stuff, you can do that on our website, which is www.drinkthemovies.com. And for extra Drink the Movies bonus content and to support the podcast, you can do that on our Patreon, which is www.patreon.com slash drinkthemovies. And, you know, we've got a lot of really fun stuff in the works coming up, Michaela, and people are going to want to make sure that they're subscribed to the podcast. Where can they do that? You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Good Pods, Near Pods, all the things, all the places where Anchor Podcasts are supported and distributed. You can find us there. We do two drops a week. Um, we have our lobby bar and then we have our deep dives. They're all tons of fun. Um, if you just can't get enough of that, you can find us on our Patreon and Brian's told you all about where to go for that. Um, that's really exciting. We love the community that we've built um, in both places. So uh, stop, have a have a browse. We have 1100, 1st <laughs> We have 111 <laughs> different deep dives. I'm sure you can find a, a film that you want to uh, make a drink with, have a, have a sit and, and have a chat about. Um, we'd love that. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Michaela, you know, we spent this week uh, seeing dead people, but next week, uh, no, no dead people. The hills are alive next week. The hills are alive with the sound of music. That's right. We are uh, we're going going to the ropes with a uh, lengthy one next week. So uh, make sure you tune in for that and all of the regular lobby bars. But, you know, for now, Michaela, we spent a long time, you know, helping ghosts move on to the afterlife. I think it's time for us to take a break have another cocktail and uh, settle in for another movie. All right. That sounds great. Well, we'll see everybody next time on drink, drink the movies. The movies. She watched you dance and she thought you were beautiful. Oh, gets me every time.